Before we start, I would just want to apologize for the delay of this video. It's been finals week and I've been very busy, and I haven't found a lot of time to look at scientific research papers, unfortunately. Also, I got really sick, which didn't help. A combination of these two events has been making a video kind of difficult, but nonetheless, I have made a video. I'll try to make videos on a weekly schedule when I can, and hopefully the much delayed 100,000 subscriber video will be done soon as well. Before we examine this week's organism, I'd just like to show off some really great Carnotaurus and other prehistoric organism artwork from some of my viewers. The first one is from Tropoteryx, and I really love the speculation focused around mating dances and the arm waggling theory. I totally wish I put this drawing in the previous video to help demonstrate the point. Darn it, Nick! Why are you so good? We also have a really cool drawing by Jockum Wittevin, I think, which shows off all the theories and speculations centered around Carnotaurus. We also have another illustration by Sax Blues, I believe, who is an Italian female artist who created a really great Carnotaurus illustration, which did a really great job showing off the speculation on feathers and the arm waggling theory. So great job! We also have a few Dimetrodon inspired illustrations as well. Thanks dudes! If you have artwork inspired by my vids, please contact me either by Twitter, DeviantArt, and even Google+. Back to our regular scheduled program. After last week's, more like last two weeks, highlight of the rather famous Carnotaurus, I'd like to highlight the rather obscure and actually really interesting Drypanosaurus, or as I like to call it, the reptilian sloth, monkey, anteater, whatever thing. Throughout paleontology, there hasn't been much on discoveries of small, flightless, arboreal, tree-dwelling animals during the Mesozoic. Sure, we got Scansoriopteryx, which is basically a prehistoric eye-eye and woodpecker mix, and we've got the yet-to-be-discovered flightless tree-dwelling ancestors to pterosaurs and birds before they evolved flight, and we've got numerous tree-dwelling lizards basically identical to the ones that we've got today. And even some theropod dinosaurs like Ornitholestes have been speculated to have some tree-dwelling capabilities. But the thing is, we don't got any Mesozoic equivalents to sloths, monkeys, and even gibbons. Where are my dino monkeys, darn it? One would think, with convergent evolution, there would be at least one Mesozoic animal to evolve traits similarly adapted to tree lifestyle to that of modern mammals. Well, thankfully, a little fossil discovered in 1979 gave us, more or less, a reptilian equivalent to a modern pygmy anteater. Drypanosaurus Drypanosaurus is the largest member of the group Drypanosaurus, a group of reptiles that is an excellent case of convergent evolution to modern mammals. Drypanosaurus itself was discovered in northern Italy, and related Drypanosaurus have been discovered in other parts of Italy, and as far as New Mexico and New Jersey, which at the time of the late Jurassic were all one continent, Pangaea. All Drypanosaurs lived in a forest coastal environment comparable to the tropical forests of modern-day Mesoamerica. At the time of this video's creation, I say this because prehistoric taxonomy tends to shift around and future discoveries may say otherwise, the clad known as Drypanosaurs belongs to the order Protosauria, a strange little group that contains numerous Triassic oddities, like the hind-limbed winged Charovicterex, Longisquama, I think the classification of Longosquama is a little wonky, and the long-necked Tanistrophius, not to be confused with long-necked Plesiosaurs, they evolve long necks independently. All these guys are some of the closest relatives to Drypanosaurus at the time of this video's creation. Yes, this guy has a very strange family tree and some very strange cousins. It's like a redneck Thanksgiving. And although these guys might look like they're closely related to snakes and modern lizards like chameleons, or the group known as Squamata, believe it or not, the protosaurs are archosaurmorphs, meaning they are closely related to crocodiles, pterosaurs, and dinosaurs than to lizards and snakes. They are distantly related to such other famous Triassic oddities as Proterosuchus, Euparcaria, and even the beaked Hyperodepodon. I think I'm pronouncing that right. Man, this family tree is weird. Again, this would be a very, very bizarre Thanksgiving with dinosaurs and pterosaurs on one side, crocodiles on the other, and Tanny Strophus struggling to fit into the picture, and Hyperodepodon being the creepy uncle no one wants to talk to, and is basically the old man from Family Guy. And as you will see, most of the animals that came out of the Triassic were really weird, and Drapanosaurus is no exception. Now, there's some studies suggesting Drapanosaurs aren't even in the crown reptilian group, Soria, that might have been basal diapsids outside the reptile crown group, as supposed by Center in 2004. Possibly closer related to Ichiosaurs. But for the time being, it is a little unclear. My bet is Drapanosaurs are inside the Archaeosaur morphs. But the 2004 study says they might even be completely unrelated to the whole Soria group. But whatever you do, don't look to lizards and snakes if you want to get a good idea of this guy. All you need to know is that the taxonomy for these guys is really, really weird. 
During the late Triassic of northern Italy about 218 million years ago, with the Permian mass extinction still a distant memory, Trypanosaurus is known from just one single specimen, and at around 50 centimeters long, or 25 inches, around a foot and a half long, it is the largest of the Trypanosaurs. The single specimen was missing the head and neck, but we are able to fill in what it probably looked like from related species, with a long neck and a small bird-like skull. It filled a niche very, very similar to a primate or modern tree-dwelling anteater, and was perfectly evolved to life in the trees. Now, Drapanosaurus and the Drapanosaur group as a whole are really interesting based on their many, many traits, as they seem to be a chimera, or a combination of many traits associated with multiple tree-dwelling animals. Again, a lightly built triangular skull that is superficially resembles those of birds, chameleon-like limbs with grasping hands and feet, Japonosaurus had an enlarged claw in its hands, it was the only one in the group with such a large claw, and finally, they all had long, tall, narrow tails. And just to add coolness onto coolness, the tip of the tail is modified into a claw. Man, it's just like Carnotaurus all over again. Where to start with all these weirdo traits? Well, let's first talk about the tail. One of the names of the clad that Trypanosaurus belongs in is Simiosauria, which literally translates to monkey lizard, and there's no doubt of where that name came from. The tail of Trypanosaurus and related species was no doubt used in the same way as the prehensile tails or grasping tails of New World monkeys. The tail probably was muscular and definitely curled around tree branches, allowing the animal to hang out and have support in everyday activities such as climbing and sleeping. As said before, the tail ended with a claw formed from fused and heavily modified vertebra in the tail. This claw definitely wasn't used for any defensive or combat purpose, and was actually used to dig deeper into tree bark, like an anchor, almost like a fifth grasping hand. Drapano could do a sort of vertical tripod stance with the tail and hind limbs clinging to the tree. This would free the forelimbs, allowing Drapano the ability to claw into the bark and not fall off at the same time. The tail would have been very muscular. It was basically a fifth limb whose sole purpose was to aid in the vertical and arboreal lifestyle of Drapanosaurus. Now, moving on to the hands and legs. No doubt a high five from this guy would be rather strange. To aid in climbing were these cool looking chameleon-esque hands and legs. And although these hands and feet greatly resemble that of a chameleon, they evolved entirely independently. Yet another good example of convergent evolution. Unique to Drapanosaurus, in particular was a large claw on each forelimb, and this is where Drapanosaurus gets its name. The name literally means sickle claw. These claws are once again reminiscent to tree-dwelling mammals, greatly resembling the pygmy anteater, which also has two large claws that it uses to dig deep into tree bark, and bug nests. Drapanosaurus did the same with its claws. This guy was definitely an insect eater. The head of Drapanosaurus are vaguely bird-like, which would again help in its insect-dependent lifestyle. The slender, almost beak-like mouth would be able to dig into tree bark and grab little grubs and other protein-filled snacks. The fossil of this guy in related species did not preserve any soft tissue, so the skin covering of Drapanosaurus is not known. But we do have some skin impressions from close-ish relatives, maybe relatives. Again, a lot of the stuff concerning Drapanosaurus ancestry is weird. One such case is the aquatic long neck. Canistrophias have shown non-overlapping semi-rectangular scales, basically square in shape. A closer relative, I think, Charavipteryx, man, I think I'm butchering that, please don't correct me in the comments, I know I'm gonna get a lot of messages, has been shown to have skin impressions adjacent to the skull, torso, and feet show the body was covered in small scales, some of which overlap. So, from, I think, related organisms, it is possible that Drapanosaurus had both non-overlapping and overlapping scales on its body. But again, these assumptions are based on the taxonomy that Drapanosaurus were protosaurs, which might be entirely incorrect. And because I'm a feather freak and I think I might have shared a dinosaur down my family tree, I gotta talk about the likelihood this guy had feathers. Well, because filament skin coverings seem to have evolved between the time crocs split from dinosaurs and pterosaurs, and when dinosaurs split from pterosaurs, Trypanosaurus is very, very far from the presence of feathers. Pigno fibers and feathers seem to have evolved long after this guy and relatives split from the family tree. Don't worry, this guy was scaly. You are safe. <laughs> Trypanosaurus lived its days exploring and wandering the trees of late Triassic Earth, watching the sun set over the death of the reign of the synapsids and the dawn of the age of the dinosaurs, in its hot and humid Italian jungle home, which still lacked primates, birds, and even fruit and flowers, which all still hadn't evolved yet, and would take many, many millions of years before they would. 
It's really strange imagining forests without monkeys, birds, or fruit in flowers. The best modern comparison to what Drapanosaurus was is the modern tree-dwelling anteaters, and most of all, the pygmy anteater. Both lived their lives up in the trees, both have prehensile tails, and both used their large claws to dig into trees. Drapanosaurus is nothing but a Triassic version of a pygmy anteater. If there's one thing I've come across on the internet concerning Drapanosaurus, is that its coloration in most drawings is very, very boring. Look at all this green. Come on people, we can do better than that. This is a fine example of what paleo artists call a paleo art meme. Basically something seen in one drawing that is copied by another paleo artist due to laziness. This process gets repeated and repeated until the image associated with the animal is universally accepted and just assumed as fact. This unfortunate process zaps creativity in paleo art and can often be seen in a lot of dinosaur illustrations. The closest thing to original coloration I've seen was done by Mark Witten, who gave it cool, flashy iridescent coloration. I'd advise giving it tree-dwelling anteater coloration. That wouldn't just be more inspired, that would be more realistic by letting it blend with the branches and tree trunks, and show off the many vaguely mammalian traits and qualities of this reptile. As far as pop culture depictions go, Drapanosaurus is fresh out of luck because it doesn't seem to have anybody concerned with its existence. Dude, this thing's a reptilian sloth monkey anteater hybrid. We need more Drapanosaurus along with more Carnotaurus. I am the Explainlax and I speak for the obscure prehistoric organisms. Put this guy in pop culture, people. Thanks for watching, and I will see you next time where we discuss the biology of a big-eyed bean with a flame-shaped helmet and the effects of radiation after a war. 100,000 subscriber special coming real soon, I'm sorry. Alright, bye. Thanks for watching again.